dear viewer, today I will be answering the question you have all been waiting for. How you, watching this, can become President of the United States. I'm going to examine the absolute minimum requirements necessary for you to take a seat behind the Resolute Desk. Number 1. The Constitution Constitutionally, you have to be a minimum of 35 years old, a resident of the United States for at least 14 years, and, unlike the requirements to be a congressperson or senator, you have to be a natural-born citizen. There's a whole debate over what that means, born in America, or American but born elsewhere, and what about Guam and Puerto Rico, but that's too complicated and lengthy of a debate for this video, so I'll just say that myself, a Brit born in Britain, is immediately out of the running. Your loss. Number two, net worth. Among the poorest presidents was Harry S. Truman. He came from a relatively impoverished background in Independence, Missouri, where he grew up on a family farm. To support himself and his family in his early life, he worked as a clerk, a timekeeper for a railroad construction company, and a bookkeeper for banks. In fact, Truman was so poor that he struggled greatly financially after he left office in 1953. His only source of income was his army pension of $112.56 per month, and he turned down multiple lucrative offers for roles as a stockholder, chairman, commercial officer, and lobbyist, which I actually find quite admirable and also totally unimaginable today. In 1965, an 81-year-old Truman joined incumbent President Lyndon Johnson as he signed Medicare into law. Truman and his wife Beth were among the first recipients. This was not just a symbolic moment politically, as Truman had long argued for state provisions for healthcare, but personally also. When Truman's background is taken into account, this new program undoubtedly saved the lives of poor elderly Americans such as himself. However, thanks to the former President's Act of 1958, ex-commanders-in-chief now receive a pension of $186,000, which increases annually, as well as access to staff, offices and travel allowances, plus secret service protection for themselves and their family, and they still take these ridiculous sums of money. So thanks to this legislation, a situation like Truman's would not occur again. Also, James A. Garfield had a pretty rough start in life. He grew up in a log cabin in Ohio and supported himself through college by working as a carpenter and janitor. He was broke when he was assassinated in 1881 due to the majority of his life being dedicated to public service. So do these cases prove that poverty is not a barrier? Well, theoretically the ridiculously high salary of $400,000 per year, plus the state benefits that one is entitled to afterwards, should not price anyone out of the job. Nonetheless, I do think there is something to be said for wealth, being relative to the connections that you make, which allow you to move up the ladder towards becoming a politician first and eventually president. Also, growing up in a log cabin was way more common in the 19th century than it is today, so it's really hard to compare, but just know that the salary and pension presidents are now entitled to would not leave you destitute. The campaigning probably would, though. Number 3. Occupation Presidents have tended to come from a relatively small pool of occupations. They have either been lawyers, writers, teachers, soldiers, businessmen, and, um, well, politicians, obviously. There are, however, some notable exceptions. Jimmy Carter's background as a Georgian peanut farmer and Ronald Reagan's past as a Hollywood actor springs to mind. And, um, Trump. We can't forget him. Is he a businessman or a reality TV star? I guess that debate is one to be had for the history books. Honourable mention here to President Eisenhower, whose occupation before his election in 1952 is listed as Supreme Commander of the Allied Forces in Europe. Top that! Number 4. Education level. Pretty much every president has been educated to a minimum of a college level. The only exceptions are Lincoln and Andrew Johnson, who both had no formal education, and Washington, Jackson, Martin Van Buren, Zachary Taylor, Millard Fillmore, and Grover Cleveland, who were only educated to high school level. James Monroe also attended college at an undergraduate level, but he never completed his degree. But it never held him or the others back. Truman also notably never completed college, withdrawing from both Community College and the University of Kansas City Law School without attaining his degree. Aside from these cases, every other president has had an undergraduate degree as a minimum and, by modern standards, it seems necessary, considering that the last president not to attend college at all, as Truman technically did, left office in 1897. So, study hard. Number 5, race. Um, <laughs> I mean, visually it's pretty obvious old white man, so if you're a young white man, you could maybe cut it, or middle-aged, more than likely, but if you're not white, up to now, you have to have had at least one white parent. Hey! There was one president who did not speak English as his first language. Martin Van Buren, who spoke Dutch. But oh god, he was an old white man. Number six, gender. <laughs> I mean, again, do I need to say it? Maybe in my lifetime. Number seven, party membership. 
Although George Washington abhorred the notion of political parties, you do have to run as a major party candidate nowadays to stand a chance. A third party candidate hasn't won electoral votes since George Wallace won five states in 1968, and you have to go all the way back to Millard Fillmore, who served between 1850 and 1853 to find the last non-democratic or republican president. A modern day example of political independence joining major parties to run for president would be Bernie Sanders, who without the platform of the Democratic Party likely would not have gained as much attention as he has. Number 8. Funds Presidential campaigns are extremely expensive, so I mean, you gotta be loaded. Or, at the very least, be talented at raising money through connections and appealing to donors through your charisma and charming personality. Now, these donors do not necessarily have to give you millions at a time, I mean, think of campaigns like Obama or Beto, but you really do need a lot to run for president. With the total spent on the 2016 election being two billion three hundred and eighty six million eight hundred and seventy six thousand seven hundred and twelve dollars Wow. So this brings me back to my earlier point of education, net worth, and occupation having a lot of significance nowadays, and unfortunately outdating some older examples, because these are the ways that most people are able to network and acquire the vast sums of money necessary to run a successful campaign. Number 9. Geography 21 out of 50 states have had presidents born there. These are Virginia, the most with 8, Ohio with 7, New York with 5, Massachusetts with 4, North Carolina, Texas and Vermont with 2 each, and Arkansas, California, Connecticut, Georgia, Hawaii, Illinois, Iowa, Kentucky, Missouri, Nebraska, New Hampshire, New Jersey, Pennsylvania, and South Carolina with one each. But then presidents can have different home states to birth states, like Obama was technically born in Hawaii, but then he was counted as being from Illinois politically, so let's just keep it simple. These are the states that have had presidents. And it is the case that candidates whose home state, whether by birth or politically, is one with a substantial amount of electoral votes, have tended to become nominees, as they're politically valuable. So, um, if your state isn't listed here, Maybe you could be the first, um, unless you're from like Wyoming. <laughs> Sorry, Wyoming. I just don't see it happening, but I would be happy to be proven wrong. To conclude, what does this list prove? Essentially, if you're a natural born citizen who has resided in the country for at least the past 14 years, you're a man, you're 55 years and six months old, born in Virginia, have attended college, and work as either a lawyer or a politician and have an existing net worth of preferably a few hundred million dollars or failing that such an amazing personality that people will have a desire to write substantial checks for you, totaling somewhere in the region of a billion dollars, then get ready to pick out the curtains you want to hang in the Oval Office. I mean, seriously, it's a pretty big deal. Sounds easy, doesn't it? Anyway, thank you so much for watching this video. I really hope you enjoyed it. Please remember to subscribe if you did. Until next time, I've been Georgia from the POTUS channel. Take care.